Thank you. Thank you, guys. So good to um, to gather here with you, see all your uh, faces, predominantly shoulders and heads. Um, and uh, it's so good to, I, you know, I wish this could be face to face, um, uh, but I'm so grateful uh, that we're able to gather online as we are doing, especially hearing some of those stories and worshiping together. And I am just particularly thankful for uh, for Sanjay and, and Raki and their little one. I just absolutely love them. We are so grateful, Hannah and I, for our friendship with them. And I am genu I'm genuinely quite jealous uh, that you get to go to a church that's led by them. I'd love to come to your church instead. Um, and be led by them. They are the real deal. And I want to um, I want to encourage you. This year has been tough for so many of us, uh, but particularly whilst trying to navigate lead and lead in changing circumstances. So if you haven't already, or if you want to again, please do send them a message to, to say thank you, thank you for your leadership. And um, I know that they've been doing an incredible job and uh, I, I know it mean to them, so much to them to just to know that you're with them and for them. And, uh, and so I can ask you to do that because I'm, I'm a visitor. I'm saying love, love your leaders. Uh, they are doing such a good job. They love you guys. Uh, we love, uh, we love all of you. Um, I have a, uh, a three and a half year old son who loves imaginative play. Um, he is always the kind of creator of this world and everyone else gets an ass assigned a part by him. And then we go on some kind of adventure throughout the house. And just last week, we started playing a new game because uh, he's seen Spider-Man for the first time. Um, and so now he says, Daddy, I want to play Spider-Man. And uh, so he says, so I'll be Spider-Man and you. And at this point, he normally assigned me as one of his kind of sidekick type role. So I'd be like the Robin to his Batman or I'd be the Pumba to his Timon or I'll be his Anna to his Elsa. And um, uh, but this time things took like a slightly different turn and he announced himself as Spider-Man and he says, you, daddy, you can be a balcony. I kind of my role uh, in this particular game was for me to just sort of sit there and he would run around and do his special moves. And I was on lookout as a balcony, an inanimate object, a balcony. I was powerless. I had very little to offer the situation. I just had to kind of sit there and watch. And as I was playing this vital and pivotal role in this adventure, I had a thought that kind of this last year in the face of a global pandemic and uncertainty and ever-changing developing situations, I've often felt like I am essentially playing the balcony role in life. Like I have no power, I have very little to offer this kind of all consuming situation that we're in. It just often feels like I'm just watching as the world unfolds. You know what, I think for so many of us, we have found this last year so deeply uncomfortable because we have felt powerless against it. You know, what we often do as humans is when we feel powerless, we then grasp for some sense of control. We often do this by obsessively kind of curating an online image and persona for ourselves on social media and elsewhere. We get lost in endless news cycles, trying to kind of uh, gain information as if that might change the situation. We shop online and we get quick dopamine hits of comfort, or, or we get lost in imaginary worlds through uh, Netflix or through games or elsewhere. And those, then there are some more subtle ways that our emotional need for control comes out. We tend to, when we feel powerless, we tend to blame everyone and everything else around us for our current circumstances. We attempt to kind of predict an unknown future and become kind of armchair experts on what's going on in the world. And we often get lost in fanatical theory or even in different uh, realities. The thing is, each of us have different ways of dealing and coping with uncertainty in our lives. 
but at the root of all of those behaviors is our discomfort at being out of control. But as followers of Jesus, what if we're not supposed to be in control? You know, there's this global storm right now that has gripped just about every nation. But, you know, storms are no new things to the world or uh, to history itself. But, you know, there's global storms, but you have your own storm that you are dealing with in the midst of this viral storm that we're in. For you, you could be fighting for your marriage. You could be fighting to keep a job. You could be fighting for your mental health or your physical health. You could be fighting for justice and equality. And so I guess the question for us is when we are in those battles and storms, what is it that we're supposed to do? Do we keep moving forward, faithfully plodding on, following one step after another, the way of Jesus? Or do we stay where we are? Do we hunker down? Do we root ourselves in the faithfulness of Jesus? What is it that we are supposed to do to follow the way of Jesus in a time of uncertainty? So today, I want to look at what Jesus does when he is in a storm. I'm going to read from Matthew 8 uh, verses 23 to 27. Do feel free to follow along. I believe it will also come up uh, on the screen as I read it. This is um, the disciples and Jesus and a little encounter that they have uh, with a storm on the lake. Uh, So it says this. They all got into a boat and began to cross over to the other side of the lake. And Jesus, exhausted, fell asleep. I feel like we could stop that there and all relate to that and we probably finish there. Uh, but we'll carry on. Uh, suddenly, a violent storm developed with waves so high the boat was about to be swamped, yet Jesus continued to sleep soundly. And the disciples woke him up saying, uh, save us, Lord, we're going to die. But Jesus reprimanded them. Why are you gripped with fear? Where is your faith? Then he stood up and rebuked the storm and said, be still. And instantly it became perfectly calm. The disciples were astonished by this miracle and said to one another, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey his words. We see uh, Jesus dealing with a storm in this passage. And what I think we see is initially quite confusing. And then, to be honest, a little bit annoying. Uh, But there is something so beautiful and so good in the way of Jesus as we try and work out how to navigate storms. Look at his response uh, to the panic of verse 23. It says this, he was exhausted and went to sleep. And then the boat is in this storm. It kicks up waves. And what we understand from uh, some of the writing and the theology around this particular encounter is that it would likely have been kind of waves crashing over the side of the boat. It wasn't kind of like, oh, it was a bit rocky. Uh, The disciples would have been soaking. They would have been absolutely terrified. And they turned to Jesus and it says he is sleeping soundly. I think we can sometimes reread some of the accounts of Jesus's life in hindsight and think, oh, isn't Jesus just amazing? He's so, he's so full of peace. He's so, oh, he's just so zen. He's so one with himself. Isn't he so great? But you like put yourself in the disciples' shoes for a moment. They're screaming at him, we need you, Lord. Where are you? What are you doing, God? We're in the midst of this crazy storm. The waves are crashing over the side of our boat. We have no idea how long this is going to last for. We don't have the end of this story yet. And you, you are sleeping. It makes you wonder, is God sleeping on us? As you consider the storms of your life, is God sleeping on you? Where is he, where is he when you most need him? 
why is it that Matthew wants us to know that Jesus was sleeping, not just sleeping, but sleeping soundly, while the waves were crashing over the side of the boat? Well, I think it's for the same reason that Jesus asks super obvious questions. Verse 25, uh, the disciples have woken him up, uh, and they, I imagine, kind of screaming at him, uh, saying, we are going to die, get up! And then Jesus asks them, why are you gripped with fear? You're like, come on, Jesus, what kind of question is that? We have just woken you up saying we are going to die. Obviously, we are gripped with fear. That's such, a, such an obvious question. Why is it that Jesus sleeps really well and then asks really obvious questions in the middle of the storm? Well, I think it's this because he wants his followers to know that are caught in that circumstance caught in the kind of global as well as personal storms that we all go through he wants them to know this that despite what's going on around you despite the circumstance that you're in that actually God is in control God is in control. I love that that's going to be the theme uh, of your encounter week. I wasn't aware of that, that this reminder that God is sovereign, that God is all powerful, that God has been with us. He is with us today and he will continue to walk with us tomorrow. Jesus approaches Jesus' approach seems strange to us of sleeping soundly and asking, uh, opposite, uh, asking obvious questions because it often feels like it's kind of the opposite way that we react to difficult circumstances. For starters, most of us don't tend to sleep very well when we're worried about things. We tend to kind of play over and over again in our mind, various scenarios, fretting about the outcomes, and we are gripped with fear and insecurities and anxieties. And we tend not to ob ask obvious questions. We tend to ask cosmic questions, like why? Why, why is this happening? Why any of this? Why me? And where are you, God? And then once we've asked those cosmic questions, we tend to revert to our coping mechanisms of, of attempting to exert control through blame shifting, obsessive tendencies and escapism. But here is Jesus living and breathing breathing the same oxygen that, that you and I breathe today, the same reality that we live in but he does it with the knowledge that God is in control. See, this is what Jesus knew as he stood in the middle of that boat, that Jesus is, that God is trustworthy, that he is sovereign, that he reigns over the world with love and justice. God is the beginning and the end. He has always been and always will be. He is more powerful than any storms. He is more powerful than any virus or any disaster or any economic downturn that might follow. He is more powerful than any government. He is, more, he is the king of kings. He is the prime minister of prime ministers. He is the lord of lords. So even when uh, he, he is in the eye of the storm and his friends, they are scared and they are drenched and they are crying out. He knows that they are secure. We will not always understand his ways, but he is trustworthy. We won't avoid pain and suffering, but he is faithful to his promises always. And we may not always have the answers, but he is always in control. And so into the midst of the howling wind and the waves, Jesus stands and he addresses the storm itself. He speaks not in this kind of meek and gentle voice, but he commands the storm with the weight and the authority of heaven behind him. And he says, be still. And instantly, it says, instantly, it became perfectly calm. 
So into your storm, into your worry, into your relationship on the rocks, into your uncertain present and uncertain future. Jesus speaks with power and he says, be still. Be still fear. Be still anxiety. Be still despair. The disciples are in awe and amazement. And now they ask the right question. They ask this, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? What they're realizing is that the creator is always more powerful than his creation. There's this beautiful line in John's gospel that says this. In this world, you will have trouble. What what an amazing guarantee from Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. This is his guarantee followed up with his promise. You will have trouble. This storm that they were in, it wasn't caused by anyone. It wasn't a result of rebellion or sin or repetitive bad decisions and wrong turns. And sometimes we are in storms simply because we are in a broken and decaying world. You know, this global storm that we are in right now, it's not a result of our rebellion. It wasn't sent by God as judgment. It's just that we will have trouble in this life. But here is the promise within it. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. I have made a way in Jesus for you to know freedom, for you to know forgiveness, for you to know peace. I've overcome the world by taking the mess and the brokenness and the decay of the world onto myself. And I've died there on the cross. And so now in my resurrection, you can take heart. For I have overcome the things that come against you in death so that you can live in this new life with me. So... How do we follow the model, the pattern, this kind of strange approach to surviving storms that Jesus has given us so that we know that God is always in control? Well, unfortunately, there's no kind of step by step instruction that I can give you at this point. I believe there's like a, if you do A, it will lead to B and eventually you'll arrive at C and everything will be absolutely great for you. And, you know, to be honest, that would totally suit us because what we would do to A, B and C is that we would take them, we would manipulate them and we'd try and control them. And then we'd be back at the starting place once again. You see, what we do is it's faith. It's trust, it's depending on God. And all of that is a lifelong journey of discovering and rediscovering his trustworthiness, his sovereignty, his faithfulness. It's a lifetime of uncovering more and more of his power and provision, a journey of being stretched and formed and shaped more and more into his likeness. So what do we do? Well, at this point, we do the only thing that we can do is we worship. We come before our creator, God, and we place him at the throne of our lives and we say, you are in control, Lord. The step by step instructions is a surrendered life. Putting our trust in Jesus, who is Lord over the wind and the waves and so lighthouse i want to encourage you as you start this encounter week of worship and prayer calling for the presence of god into your hearts and homes and neighborhoods and networks i want to encourage you to come before him honestly i want you to i want to encourage you in that moment of worship and prayer to start 
with your discomfort, to carry your pain of this last year into his presence, to bring your fear, to bring your doubt, to bring your worry and place that with the King of Kings and start with a prayer along the lines of, I thank you, Jesus, that you are in control and I am not. I thank you, Lord, that you are in control, that you have a plan, that you are still faithful to your promises. I want to encourage you because I think we often bring our kind of in, like, it's seemingly insurmountable problems to the table and we meet it with a fairly small, fairly powerless God. But in worship, we remind ourselves in prayer and in reading of the scripture, we remind ourselves that God is bigger than our problems. He is more powerful than our fear. You know, we worship a God who is the kindness and comfort of a lamb, but he is also the fierce, powerful lion. So I want to encourage you as you take time to pray and to really, to really take time to pray. Don't count yourself out from that. This is going to be a significant week for you as a church community and you have a part to play. Even if you're kind of like, I don't really like praying or I don't really know how to do it or this thought of doing an hour's worth of prayer, just kind of, oh, I don't know how. Just bring yourself honestly. Bring yourself as honestly as you can possibly bring yourself to that moment and to that meeting before a kind and powerful God. A God who will speak his kind words into your heart, but also remind you that he is powerful and in control. Whilst I was um, uh, thinking and, and praying about coming to uh, be with you guys this morning, I had a picture for you as a church as you kind of worship and pray in your homes i just got this um simple picture it was a reminder that you are lighthouse church but you are becoming houses of light that your rooms and your homes are becoming altars for the presence of god the place where god dwells that these altars would kind of eventually become little fires that are lit not just in one place in lighthouse church building but in many homes many places many rooms many hearts throughout our city bringing transformation bringing healing bringing the presence of god into your home into your family into your relationships and then out into your neighbourhoods, into the streets, into your workplaces. You are lighthouse church, but you are becoming houses of light. And so as you kind of set yourselves up for this encounter week, I want to encourage you to take stock of who God is and take heart that he has overcome the world. Take stock of a God who is trustworthy who is faithful to his promises. He has been faithful before. He is faithful today. He will be faithful tomorrow. And take heart that he has overcome the world. He has a plan for you. Your dreams are not on hold. Your life is not on pause. But he has a plan for you. We're going to finish by watching a video. It's a uh, a short kind of uh, liturgy that we uh, wrote and recorded here at St. Mary's. And I just, as I was re-watching it, I just thought it might be helpful for us to take time, uh, encourage you where you are, just to kind of get comfortable and as much as you can. I know that uh, some of you uh, have kids around and, you know, just try as hard as you can. And um, I'll wave back at Meeks, who is waving at me for many parts of that, um, which I really enjoyed. Uh, but in the midst of that, uh, and in the midst of uh, the distractions, um, I want to encourage you to just take this moment to just bring yourself into the presence of God. Invite him, almost as you kind of prepare that altar for this week in your home, in your heart. Taking stock of a God who has always been there, always will be and is with you today and take heart that God has overcome the world, that he is for you, that he is with you in the middle of the storm and he speaks into your fear, he speaks into your doubt, he speaks into your uncertainty. Be still and know that I am God. 
So why don't you take time to pray together? We are going to pause for a moment and listen to and reflect on some of the promises of God. Make yourself comfortable where you're sat. Try and relax your body and close your eyes to distractions as you slow down. Take a deep breath and recenter your scattered senses upon the presence of God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We take stock of our powerful God. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for your sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We take heart for he is faithful to us. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Lord, in these dark and difficult times, grant me grace to seek your face with undiminished love. Replenish my reserves for the road is long. Surprise me in the coming day with glimpses of your goodness, hints of your holiness, and a song of hope in this very strange land. Amen. Um.